Welcome everyone to the final Meyer Sound webinar of this summer. Um, I'm super excited about today. We have a lot to discuss and therefore I intend to um, take it away out of the gate. Um, we have major guests today, uh, 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 a, a pivotal instrumental piece of history. So um, let's, 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 let's start doing this. So um, welcome to those that are joining us through Facebook, which is the primary channel where we conduct these webinars. Thank you for joining us once more. The Facebook community is a, is a community that is rising at a steady paid space, uh, pace, um, currently counting over 9,000 members and rising. So welcome to you as well. As I mentioned before, this is gonna be the final webinar of the summer, but rest assured, of course, we intend to keep you post, posted of uh, future webinar developments so rest assured, um, this will not be the absolute last webinar. Uh, that being said, today is the grand finale. Um, we're going to talk about uh, decades of history from Grateful Dead to Dead and Go. And therefore, I would like to start with introducing uh, my co-host, as always, the venerable Bob McCarthy. Uh, Bob, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Hello. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that. And um, we have two uh, guest appearances today, uh, none other than John Meyer himself, the president and CEO, CEO of Meyer Sound. Um, huge honor. Uh, John, happy to have you here. How's the connection? Uh, the connection is fine. I can hear everything fine. Excellent. Thank you for confirming. And then finally, uh, Derek Featherstone, the CEO of Ultrasound, as well as front of house engineer of uh, Dead & Co. Uh, Derek, are you with us? I am. Yes, all is good. Excellent. Well, um, let's get started. Um, super interested in what we're going to see in the next one and a half hours or so. And that means that, um, Bob, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, who are the Grateful Dead, if you have been living under a rock. Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, besides being my favorite band, um, they are, of course, in a very quintessential American band. And what really makes them uh, outstanding and interesting in our context is they're very experimental in both the musical sense and in the um, and in the technological sense. They pushed the art by through experimentation, endlessly tweaking songs over over a 50-year period, and uh, always just refining them to try to making them better. In the same way, they worked towards making guitar technology better. Um, on their all their instruments, really innovative, interesting percussion instruments, and they were pushers of sound technology. And that made the marriage of Grateful Dead and Ultrasound and Meyer Sound become a really long-term uh, goal towards the common goals of, of sound, uh, great sound. The thing, the, the, the players here, of course, uh, you know, Jerry Garcia is the leader of the band, Bob Weir, the uh, rhythm guitar, Phil Lesh, the bass, we'll meet them all, the uh, Nicky Hart and Bill Kreutzmann on the drums, and Pigpen uh, was the singer and harmonica. The, <clears throat> the last thing that I wanted to, to mention was that, you know, there's a, just a long-term, long-term quest for great sound, and the sound, the deal about the dead is the show is entirely about the sound. There's nothing going to happen. There's no pyro. There was no staging. There's no costume changes. There's nobody dropping in from a from a lift. Um, it's just three guys, uh, just three hours of people standing there playing music and everybody enjoying that. So it's all about the sound that was always first, and that's really what it's is all about. Thank you, Bob. So, so this is going to be a round table, and that means that um, I encourage all our panelists, uh, John and Derek, to add any wisdom, any knowledge, anecdotes that you might have uh, at your discretion. Um, when we prepared this webinar, we said that first we want to talk a little bit about uh, a key player in the history of, of Grateful Dead, which is uh, Owsley Bear uh, Stanley. <laughs> where yeah. do you, where do you start? Well, I, think, well, I, I, just yeah. met, I first met uh, Bear at uh, when I was working at McCune's in the early '70s or in the '70s when uh, he they were uh, they bought they did a lot. Of, we'll talk about McCune's later, but like he was interested in differential microphones and uh, uh, 
and all kinds of things. And I showed him uh, Olson Engineering and showed him that uh, we talked, you know, so it was like um, very interesting in terms of his vision of uh, that every member of the band would, would, be, would be oriented from his point of view. In other words, sound would come from each member of the band. Uh, so he had some very strong ideas about how PA should be done. Thank you. Now, Derek, you conducted an interview with um, none other than Bob Weir prior to this, um, prior to this um, webinar. Um, and you asked Bob several questions and you send us the recording and we decided to show several clips of said recording in, in today's webinar, correct? Sounds good. I, I take no responsibility for what I said though. Okay. <laughs> so the, the first clip is that we're going to see, the first clip that we're going to see is, is um, well, you know what? Just let's, let, let's watch it. It will speak for itself. What's the first memory or story that comes to mind that sums up Bear and his uniqueness, as I might call it? <laughs> Bear and his uniqueness. Well, he uh, he wanted to he wanted to be our sound mixer. He astutely uh, surmised that the sound mixer was uh, an integer in the band. You know, uh, he maybe not a full fledged band member, but his role was very important. And in in so far as uh, he wanted to showcase that by uh, by he wanted to mix the band, but he wanted to mix it mix the band from on stage so the people yeah. so he could uh, so he could uh, you know do his uh, little bear dance on stage and, and uh, to uh, people's amazement <laughs> yeah <laughs> and sure. and uh, great entertainment i would expect um yeah. <laughs> that that didn't he he did he tried that a couple of times and it just didn't work. I mean, you know, he wanted to be on stage, but you can't mix a band from on stage. You can do it. You have to be out in front to hear what's happening out in front in order to hear hear that. But uh, he was worth it. He was was certainly uh, all about giving it a try. Yeah, I like that. So I would think it's funny because I I would think after that phase closed down and the wall of sound is gone, I would think you guys could have got to a place where you would actually never listen to a, a sound engineer again <laughs> because of <laughs> what had happened there. But, but I know in my reality, the opposite is true. And, and um, there's always been a great trust you guys have had with engineers. And, um, and I think it's, it's, it's very motivational because it allows that engineer to take some ownership of the show and translate it more and make it better and do, you know, take it somewhere instead of just being running around with handcuffs and a volume knob. And it's, it's, and I know that, Personally, as I've benefited from that with, you know, Dead and Company, and it's in fact made me want to advance that sonic sonic experience even more every time I go out there and do more and more and more. So it's a great dynamic, I think. Well, yeah, you know, once again, it's important that uh, the the artists and the uh, and the and the sound guys uh, who are artists as well uh, get to know each other, and, yeah. uh, and 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 get to get on the same, uh, you know get on the same path, you know, get on the same, uh, not working against each other, but working towards something. Working towards something. Um, Derek, is that something that you can relate to? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, <clears throat> it is true that the dynamic is, is so, um, it's a collaborative approach where there's a lot of artists and engineers that don't connect and it's just a, a, a task. It's not really an environment for creativity and growth, I think. Right. So our journey continues with uh, the uh, inevitable wall of sound. Um, John, could you elaborate how you got involved in this particular project? Uh, Bear was, uh, it, we were working on the differential microphone and he brought up the fact that the sound wasn't making it up to the balconies in some of the places. And uh, uh, I was more in, interested in kind of bringing the technology. There was a lot of research that was done by RCA it's called old engineering, but his work was out of print at this time. It was all done in the forties, but I had a copy of the book from uh, when I was working at a, a high end hi-fi store. I, the owner gave me a copy of the of Olson engineering and Olson in there described that line arrays, uh, when you make them tall like that, have a tendency to beam. 
Uh, so I said to Bear, I showed him also, I said, you know, you, it's, it, they beam like that. You have to make it all the way to the ceiling in order to get this to work. I said, you know, what we ought to do is make a barrel shaped speaker, uh, spherical speaker of some type. Uh, Bear was into honeycomb material. They wanted to build it. I, I said, fine, but I just want to do the parts. And this is a three way. The center cluster is what we kind of came up with. I wanted to try a large array of drivers. Uh, because I wanted to test to see if the phase got better with big arrays versus little arrays and things like that, because it was kind of, phase was very early thinking at this time. But if you look at that, you'll see the the, dry, the 12s and then there's like the five inches and the, is the next one. And then the, there's the tweeters at the top, a, uh, a very high efficient uh, tweeter that made by Electro Voice. In fact, that row of tweeters bought the year supply of electric voice tweeters in order to make this array. Uh, <laughs> this was, uh, I think, uh, Bob McCarthy, well, I think it's called the vocal array or something. I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, yeah. That was vocals and drums. Well, l let's see what uh, Bob Weir has to say about it. Was well, there one specific point in time, like, per like perhaps after a less than stellar concert, that you guys concluded enough is enough and decided you wanted to develop the wall of sound and create a new standard for sound systems. As, as I recall, uh, the Warlocks back then uh, decided we needed our own PA because we wanted to go out and play parties and stuff like that. And we needed to go out and get a PA. We went to the local uh, electronics store and, and this uh, the guy at the electronics store uh, uh, gave us uh, two four-foot uh, linear array speaker columns and, uh, and said, this is all the PA you're ever going to need. And, uh, <laughs> and we took that home. Uh, we took that to my parents' place. They were having a little get-together, and, uh, and, and they decided uh, they wanted the Warlocks to play at that, their little get-together. And we, we hooked it up and strung it up, and... Uh, you know, test the microphones and all that kind of stuff. And then we started playing and Pigpen picked up his harmonica and, uh, and played his first, uh, first couple of notes uh, to that and blew it up. And that was that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy never worked again. Um, but we were aware of the, uh, the linear array principle uh, it's pretty easy to uh, it's pretty easy to comprehend. So that was just bubbling around for uh, for a number of years, and then finally, finally in the early '70s, at some point we decided, okay, let's just go ahead and do this. We have uh, at, by that point we had uh, we had helped uh, see um, Alembic and uh, and their production facilities. And we had a, a, a nice little collection of, uh, of uh, a, a nice little group of, uh, of, of engineers and, and technicians and, and people who, who could actually uh, put all those kind of thing together, you know, Ron Ricochet, Owsley Stanley, those kind of folks. Um, and, uh, and Don Pearson and, 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 uh, and so, You know, we were starting to have some success, and and uh, and we and the, the money was starting to come in, and so it was it was it was never a matter of if; it was only a matter of when we were going to be able to get around to it. And we finally, uh, finances made it possible for us to get around to it, and we 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 did it, and we we built the wall of sound, and it was uh, it worked. It worked way better than we had any need for it to work. I mean, you could you could get. Yeah appreciable sound pressure level of a mile away. And, uh, and where are you going to find that? Right. Where, where are you going to find, you know, appreciable sound pressure a mile away? Um, here we see a wonderful um, photo in color of the same uh, wall of sound pressure at a mile away. Uh, anyone that would like to comment to that statement by, by Bob Weir? Well, I, would, I would comment on the fact that what, what, what parents invite the Warlocks to play in their backyard? That's a, that's a unique relationship there itself. <laughs> but, but I, and also with this, it's funny when I see this wall, obviously this is, you know, a little before my time for sure. But the, um, when I see this system and the pictures of it for so many years in the Bay area, the, um, 
you'd go into a nightclub like the Berkeley Square, or when all those clubs on Broadway were, were doing, we were doing gigs in the early 80s, you would see little pieces of the sound system. So you like you look under the stage and you'd see one of these blonde subwoofer boxes or you'd see a cabinet because it, as it, it all just went places, but no one knows where necessarily, but every once in a while. And then I think the Berkeley Square is the one, John, that had the, the um, 650 prototype, the single 18 driver. You know, I remember being in there and, and pulling it off, saying, well, there's only one speaker in here. And, but it was really interesting to see how that system got dispersed throughout the Bay Area into, into nightclubs, which is kind of cool, I thought. I'd like to well, make one, one comment that what we learned from this array uh, was really interesting is because there was a lot of talk about phase. And one of the things is that there was the proposal uh, from the science community that if you made the arrays big enough, they, it would be more phase coherent. But I noticed when we measured this array, other than it worked very well in terms of power and distribution and did what they want, uh, from a technical point of view, it didn't help the phase very much, which meant we were going to find a different way to correct the phase for loudspeakers than pure physical size. So we learned a lot. These were, I mean, they were wonderful. You, you, you try to, uh, I mean, it was wonderful to have an opportunity to work with someone that when you're not 100% sure exactly what the outcome's going to be, uh, rather than, you know, it becomes so much in this industry that most producers want you, they don't want to gamble at all. <laughs> Right. Bob, you, oh, you, you, I'm, a, I'm an ear witness to the system. I heard it uh, many times and heard it at great long distances like Weir describes. And I can tell you what's the, it's still a sound that I can, uh, that I can go back to my brain. It really was tremendous. And what it had was the, what, what he described also, what John described was the instruments all in their places. So you really had the mix of the sound was occurring acoustically in the space. Um, an immersive sound uh, experience, uh, and that was um, really, really quite something to achieve. So, so I propose we go to the next clip where Derek asks um, Bob how the wall of sound basically changed um, large scale sound reinforcement. So then I guess, so like say prior to the wall of sound, from a performance perspective, what was the uh, most obvious, like the limiting factor you faced when performing before that system? And then after that system, what did you solve, you think? Well, when we first started working, uh, you know, for, for instance, when we went and saw the Beatles at, uh, at the Cow Palace, you know, they, they had uh, those, uh, those PAs that were just basically a bunch of horns, basically, uh, yeah, you know, just stack, 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 yeah. We used to call them, and uh, and they sounded awful, and uh, and that was that. It wasn't it wasn't anything. It sounded like it was coming through a telephone. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, at the Beatles concerts, it didn't much matter because the girls were screaming so loud you couldn't hear that. But uh, but you know, I remember going and hearing Ike and Tina Turner over uh, one of those systems, and it was it was pretty awful. You know, the band was great, uh, and, and you, uh, you're, you're adjusted. So, uh, so the music came across, but still, it wasn't as, uh, as fulfilling an experience as, uh, as it could easily have been with, uh, with better sound. And we were yeah, all, yeah. Uh, and so there, were, there was a need for, for better sound all along, and we've always been interested in better sound all along, and the, the more yeah. dynamics, the, uh, the the cleaner, all that kind of stuff, the better. There was a need for better sound, um, which brings us to the next chapter, which is a uh, McCune sound. Um, anyone care to comment on on what was said during the past uh, two minutes or so? Well, I think it's interesting. Like uh, I think that in some ways uh, the. Bob and uh, Phil and the guys who are sort of driving the, and, and Jerry who are driving the boat on, you know, progressing with sound actually may have experienced it more from other people's concerts. So here these musicians are going to watch someone else play and realize, wait, from this perspective, the crowd perspective, this kind of sucks. So when we go back to our normal job and we're up on stage playing, let's try to make it better for the crowd enhancement thing. And that's kind of been a Grateful Dead model from everything from the ticketing to everything in the course of time has always been about a, a crowd sort of enhancement or a better experience for the patrons. So. One of the conversations I had with Bear and the band is that uh, I felt like 
the wall of sound in a big place was very loud for the members, you know, because all the sound is pushing through them. I mean, one of the, uh, so I suggested that maybe we could use some of the speakers I was building at McCune's for delays and things like that to, to take some of the, so that they'd still have, each member would still have their individual sound, like the bass would come from where Phil was, drums would come from the drums, vocals would come from the center, but we would take some of the power out for the balconies and, and long throw, try to move it out. I mean, we had delay lines coming and things like that. So this is, uh, I, I got a chance to do things that, you know, take some of the speakers and show that we could get the power without, we could maintain the power using this technology and not, uh, and have both, have the uh, monitors on stage become more, uh, not so powerful for the, the bands would have to be in front of the entire sound system to do a stadium. It was not going to work. I, I see. Yeah, this is, this is, I was going to say that, um, John, when I early on a sh short stint in my life, I worked at McCune and, um, and I do remember servicing a bunch of JM threes and, and it was such, it's such, such an incredible sounding box. It was, it was kind of funny because in the process of it, there was never any wheels for it. So the JM three was basically hauled into a truck with a, dolly and the next one and, and you'd see you come to a load in with hand trucks rolling the speakers with no wheels on them which i i think the wheel was invented back then but i'm not sure what happened <laughs> well well from what i can tell there were not just no wheels there was apparently also no rigging because this looks like roping <laughs> <Exactly>. to me <laughs> yes yeah this is early <laughs> yeah, fire marshal fire marshal didn't like that one but so um, another milestone that we discussed with John Meyer in another webinar was, of course, ACD system. Um, um, and, and John, do you care to elaborate a little bit about that? This was, there were several things surfacing. Transistor amplifiers were not sounding good and no one, we could measure them. We had all the measurement equipment in the world and they, they, transistor amps measured perfectly, but tube stuff sounded better. And that was driving us crazy. I mean, you could you could hear tube stuff if, even if the, we're in the room with it. You could tell when, like I worked in a hi-fi stereo and I could tell when they were playing tube stuff in the front room as I was doing service in the back, or I could tell when they had transistor stuff was coming on. So one of the things that we, that uh, Odala from um, Philips uh, did some research and did a paper on the fact that there was a thing called trans intermodulation distortion or something that was happening in the feedback loop of amplifiers transistor amplifiers with a high gain that was causing uh, a bad sound. And so this was the, uh, this, this was the first amplifier that we built in Switzerland that had 300 volts per microsecond, very fast uh, transistor amplifier. I mean, it had a bandwidth of 100 megahertz to see if we could get around this problem of, of having feedback in the loop. Plus I wanted to do it phase corrected as best we could at the time uh, and uh, kind of, you know, very high, this was a very high quality uh, system called the ACD Studio Monitor. Uh, our building in Switzerland was really quite expensive to, to bring in. The Grateful Dead, we, sh we, we loaned them a pair on the, in there for bearers, the one that heard it at, um, when we were playing in Berkeley and then I took it over to the front street and came back money to get them and they wouldn't give them back to us. They said they were gonna go borrow the money or something and buy them, but these were, they, they cost a fortune. Uh, but we sold a few of them and Bobby bought a pair. Uh, so we started to sell some of them, you know, because it was really um, kind of a state of the art system. Well, let's see what Bob Weir has to say about Meyer Sound Studio monitors uh, in, the, in the late 70s. I guess, you know, as the 70s wrapped up, which I kind of always like put in as the wild, wild west approach to, you know, to sound. Um, in the 80s or early 80s, late 70s, it got more precise. Was there anything in particular that you remember that kept you guys in step with Meyer Sound? And John Meyer, particularly, what was the commonality there that you saw and had with him? Well, I, um, I attended the uh, AES show um, in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. and I was walking by a booth and I heard this violin music coming out. Uh, it was a pair of violin. And uh, I thought there was a violin in there. And it was, it was an excellent performance and it just stopped me in my tracks. And so I, I, I went into the booth to, uh, to check out this violin player. And it was uh, the Meyer Sound booth. And I'd never heard speakers that, uh, that realistic. Uh, that you know, fully dimensional and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, I was 
I was taken aback. And I, uh, and I met John the, that afternoon and, uh, and <laughs> I came back from the AES show to, uh, to rehearsal at, uh, at our place on Front Street and, and told the guys in the band, uh, hey man, I just heard these speakers. You, you gotta hear these speakers. Uh, they, they're just, they're unthinkable. Nobody believed me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but finally uh, somebody, uh, somebody managed to get uh, 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 a couple of the guys up to John's place in Berkeley to, uh, to listen to him. I think I might have, uh, I might have had a, a hand in that. And, uh, and they came back believers. And and so yeah. we were off to the races with uh, with Meyer Sound. Off to the races with Meyer Sound, um, and another milestone within the Meyer Sound history, um, which led to the um, to the Ultra Monitor. This was really pivotal, right? Really key, is my understanding. Yeah, let me just say, like we actually demonstrated the ACDC monitor on stage first to see if they wanted that kind of quality, because there was a lot of idea that stage monitors monitor should be you know blend the sound together i mean that was one of the things that uh there was a company that made one that looked that was called the the horn had it look like a screen in front of it called the potato masher i'm not gonna say the company and uh that had a tendency to blend the sound together now those three vocals would turn into this kind of blended sound and i i, I knew what that was it was like comb filtering and uh so i wanted to make sure that they would like this sound before we went to the trouble to build it more powerful. The ultra monitor, the problem with the ACD studio monitor wasn't powerful enough to, to keep up with the sound in a concert like that. So before we made it, made it dedicated, something that had to be 10 dB louder, uh, wanted to make sure they liked it. And so that's what led to the ultra monitor is a, is a very high, high quality, that's a high five speaker uh, for the band, which was a departure. In fact, we had to wind up uh, with Howard because some of the not the Grateful Dead, but some of the other bands missed that blending effect. So we actually used a delay line with 150 to 100 milliseconds delay, summed it back into the signal to feed it to the ultra monitor for people that wanted to have that more blending effect, uh, just to give you a feel of what was going on at the time. Bob, do you have anything to add? Because during your um, history of theater sound, we also learned that the UM1 is really a major milestone. Well, everybody that heard the UM1 for the first time uh, was shocked. It was, it was just a shocking experience at the clarity of the thing. People would stand at the mic and nobody had ever heard that kind of power and that kind of clarity, its ability to project the vocal. And of course, it being a complete system with the, um, that you couldn't just buy the 12 inch driver or buy the horn or buy the cabinet it was Meyer Sound's approach in the industry now was a complete system, which was its dedicated controller would set the crossover parameters, set the phase correction, and set the dynamic limits of the system for self-protection. So it was a revolutionary uh, introduction into the industry. A system that literally you could say to somebody, just go at it, go throw, you know, scream as loud as you want. We're not worried. So um, enter Dan Healy into the equation. No, now knowing Dan came in before this, but this is a pretty interesting picture, I think, because this is um, this guy with the red shorts, I believe, is um, Joe Ravitch. And uh, I can't tell where this was taken, but uh, in fact, I guess Jay took this picture. I should have asked him where it came from. But in that console, someone's going to correct me, but I think that I, it was either a Claire console or a, a Paragon. But um, but this was sort of he was another one of those indi one of those key individuals that came in with this again make it better, build a better mousetrap mentality. And then uh, two names that were already mentioned um, in the past 15 minutes, but were, you know, deserve a, a proper uh, introduction. Who would like to introduce these uh, key figures? Well, I'll go ahead and do it. So you got Don Pearson here and Howard Danchuk. And these guys are obviously they started ultrasound in somewhere 79, 80, and, and their role was to you know, they were brought on to bring a better monitor rig to the Grateful Dead. So they were originally working with John on the 
you know, ultra modern side of things. And as, as it developed, hey, can you do something the same for a sound system? So they uh, marched down the path to, to, again, meet that need. Um, this is a good one with, uh, this is in Las Vegas a few years later where it's Don Howard and Dan Healy all, you know, the, the relationship with these guys was, was really unique because, you know, Dan, Dan would be the guy to sort of push really hard, you know, Don would be the guy to say, yeah, spend everything we have possible to make it better. And, and Howard would be the one, well, let's spend only some of what we have. And so the dynamic of the three of them kept anyone from getting completely lost in the middle. So it was, it was a good, good relationship. And, and I think what I noticed about it is, at ultrasound, from from day one, there was this kind of it was a collaborative culture, and the culture was to do things right, and and you know, and it was met with this concept that we don't, it well, there's no resistance if you're doing something that's three times as hard, but it's right. No one would say, oh, this sucks, this is difficult. Be, this is how it's done. And even I'd give Howard head of, for for a while there, we would make certain mic cables, and he had a series of mic cables that we ordered red sleeves for him and they were for SIM machines only. So he had this scenario where no, you can't, like if you took one of his SIM cables and used it to wire up a microphone on stage, he would get furious with you because they were only allowed to be used with SIM machines and BNK microphones. So it was, it was a really unique, and I think that mentality kind of was the Grateful Dead guys were all the same. It was just this like, we're gonna work together and we're gonna collaborate and we're gonna get somewhere because they're all trying to get somewhere. It was, it was a neat, and I think John is the same thing in his company. So it was really cool to see. So here you see an example of a huge amount of uh, effort featuring all the products that we've uh, seen so far. Um, now, I, I was, um, I was um, two years old at the time, so don't ask me to comment uh, on this particular uh, slide, but I'll leave it up to the, to the, um, to the industry professionals uh, in our midst. <laughs> okay. What do you do? Well, your main PA is the JM10s. Which uh, which have wheels? Um, <laughs> and, Those ones uh, do. Yeah, exactly. So this is a it's a completely ready to go modular system. The JM10 was of course the, uh, John's design at McEwen, but it's a complete system with its complete rack, its controllers, crossovers, dedicated and dedicated amplifiers. There's there's basically you can have it this way or not have it. Um, so that's a McEwen um, sound system there with JM3s on the floor. And then you start to see the Meyer sound speakers on the stage. We've got ultra monitors um, on the stage there for the, um, all the fullback. And then you also will uh, see a, primitive, a primordial version of the 650 subwoofer being used as Phil's bass rig. So we've already started to uh, get on stage and influence the musicians. And you'll see later we'll work our way into the main PA. I just noticed that in that um, skull and roses above the stage there, um, that prop, we somehow that just appeared, that exact one came back and joined us on New Year's Eve at the Chase Center last year as we were kind of trying to build up the room. Somehow somebody connected to all this through FM Productions <laughs> appeared with that and, and, the, and the fire marshal wouldn't allow us to hang it because it was just these slats of plywood and, and one by four and just kind of time, it was a little bit easier back then to get away with things I suppose. Um, talking about talking about New Year's Eve, uh, one year later, the Oakland Arena uh, 81 on uh, New Year's Eve, um, we, we see a stage that is essentially completely filled um, with uh, Meyer Sound uh, products. Um, but there's a story to these MSL3s, right? Uh, yes. yes. Well, I, the, these are the early MSL3s, which had uh, a tweeter array in them, which I think you can see in the left-hand picture. So one of the problems we had with uh, compression drivers at this time is that uh, they, we're, this was a funny time where people marketed their, their marketing would kind of rule the sound industry uh, and gave us promises of what stuff could do that didn't do it. So one of the reasons we started measuring everything is because nothing measured the way that it was being promoted. And one of the problems with compression drivers, they didn't go to very high frequencies. So we, especially the big ones, the four inch drivers. So we had tweeter arrays built into the, uh, these were a, a tweeter that uh, Motorola came out with using piezoelectric crystals, which was very efficient, very powerful. Uh, and uh, so those were in the first uh, MSL speaker. There's a picture of the array there. Uh, and it's little, it, it was really easy to cross these over because the tweeters are capacitors. So you just put it, so it's easy. You could 
passive, you could, we coupled it in passively so that the whole high frequency was being driven from the amplifier. There wasn't a separate channel for it. And we just crossed the tweeters into, since there was no high end anyway coming out of the driver, it was easy to have the tweeters come in. And that capacitor, that little tank circuit there was just to protect them from over excursion. But it's, it's also my understanding that these tweeters lift about one foot in front of the other transducers, which presented a unique challenge. Yes, they, they hit you first, which generally what, what we were learning is, remember, phase at this time was still considered, uh, you know, we were deaf to phase, uh, so it didn't matter. But like, uh, one of the things we got worried about is that, is that really true? And started to kind of like, when, when just experimenting around, we found we put the tweeters in front like that, the, the whole system would sound a little bit brighter. Uh, things like violins would be more edgy and stuff like that. So we decided that we needed to time align this stuff, which was just a, a early thinking at this time. Most of the scientific community just thought we were nuts to even consider. It's like saying that we hear 100,000 cycles or light or some other kind of thing. They just said it was nonsense to phase correct stuff. But we were, uh, we built this circuit uh, because the problem is with digital was just coming out and digital using the filters, the aliasing filters had a lot of phase shift. So we built this time correction filter for Sony's F1 player and other digital systems that uh, to correct the phase. And we wound up using this, uh, which we'll show later for correcting speakers, this kind of technology. So, so, so that, that particular um, um, device um, was the uh, impetus um, for, or, or it wasn't the impetus, the tweeter array was the impetus living one foot in front of the other transducers, but the technology that was developed for, for, the, for the time correction circuit that we saw previously then uh, inspired the, the M3T. Yeah, once we, once we, we, we put it on a switch, as you can see in there, uh, so people could satisfy themselves that, because building that little thing was expensive at that time. I mean, doing delay analog is expensive. So it takes lots and lots and lots of stages. Uh, digital, of course, is effortless, but in the analog world, it's not effortless. Uh, and so we had a switch there so people could turn it on and off to decide if they wanted to be brighter or not. We gave, uh, some of those people hated those little controls and some, you know, it was, it was kind of our, the most we generally gave people was some controls like that on the sub panel, but you could, you could lock it off. Um, one, you, one of the you, key things about it is it, an easy solution would have been to just break out the tweeters into a separate amplifier and delay yeah. them one millisecond, right? But yeah. that means you have to buy a whole other set of amplifiers and you, it becomes a tri-amplified device. So this allowed us to be able to satisfy and keep it just a simple bi-amplified but to and a passive crossover and then time correct this thing. Um, as you see here. So it was an elegant solution. It took 12 stages, three of those time correction filters, uh, a total of 12 stages of all pass filters to pull this thing back. Now, Bob, what, what, what separates the MSL3A from the MSL3? Well, the MSL3 is the one with the tweeter array. Um, so it's got the MSP4 tweeter array. Then <clears throat> just, just in the same way that ultrasound pushed, they were one of the big pushers to, um, to get the, 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 that time correction. I remember taking the first hand-built prototypes that, that John and I put together and we, we took those out to, uh, to a Grateful Jed show at the Greek theater and we pushed, we got the time correction to go for the first time. But then a couple of years later, they just wanted to, to push the envelope again and they wanted to be able to do this without the tweeter array at all uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we, we looked at the, making our own driver. Um, John can describe that more at length, but basically we, we had to make our own driver and then we were able to get rid of the tweeter array by getting a driver with an extended response and that became the MSL3A. John, would you, would, you, um, um, would you do us the honor of elaborating a little bit about that new and improved driver? Yeah, well, it... it... I mean, taking on to build a four inch compression driver was a big, big deal, you know, for us at that time. We were, we were small, still a small company and taking on a project like that. But I had a good team and I had some people from Switzerland that were very high quality techs that we could figure out how we could make this thing. We decided that we would build a high frequency compression driver 
that would extend all the way out to 18,000, 15, you know, so we wouldn't, we could get rid of the rain and also fix some of the problems. Uh, these drivers, if you look at the picture on the left, you see this kind of dip, even on a, is that third octave or octave? I don't know. But anyway, you can see there's a big hole around 8,000 cycles. We needed to fix that hole, which was caused by the phasing plug, and also extend its uh, bandwidth out to 15,000 so we could get rid of the tweeter array. Uh, and so this was quite an undertaking. And we did this without telling anybody. We didn't tell the industry we were doing this because we wanted to uh, learn how to build these things. We need to learn how to make them reliable and last and, and so I think the first implementa implementations was with the Grateful Dead and since the, it worked out ideal because the processor already had the, the switch you could switch the delay correction out so we didn't have to all we had to do is change out the driver so it it, it was look like um, it's kind of one of the pushes I really wanted to build my own driver we're having a lot of problems with consistency from these manufacturers I mean it's one of the things that that we when we built the um, ACD studio monitor uh, the, the, the tendency is want to correct this, the speaker, uh, electronically, you know, so you make it and you correct it, which is still a thought. The problem with that, it makes it difficult to repair if you don't have some way of measuring it in some free field space. So I wanted to start making parts that we could exchange. Like when you exchange light bulbs in your house, you don't have to recalibrate and make the screws and everything. You can just screw it in and basically have the same 60 watts you had before. So I wanted the parts to be retro, you know, so if something broke, we could send parts and they could put them in themselves without having to realign the system. So building, we wanted a more consistent driver. We wanted a, uh, we wanted something that would last and knowing, and uh, no one was, in, I couldn't get anybody in the industry to do this. I mean, they just uh, were not interested in, I mean, there was nobody that would, was helping, none of the companies that were building stuff would want to help make the stuff better. I mean, it's not, it, I think that's just kind of, the nature of sound is it's kind of like, I mean, they'll spend billions of dollars on video and stuff like that. But when you get to sound, it's harder to get money for it. Uh, I don't know why, but it just is. And, and so this was a huge undertaking for us to get this to, to work and be reliable and robust. I think it was several years before we even announced that we were doing it. So Bob, you wanted to comment? I was just gonna say, we, we had to do so much modification to that third party driver. I mean, it would come in and we'd immediately take it all apart and, and rebuild it and modify it. So, it, you know, it was like it was already a lot of work, a lot of rework. Um, so you know, we were already part, part of the way there. And but it's still a big move to go to making your own motor. Right. So, so I'd like to talk a little bit about synergy because uh, these loudspeaker products were used in an environment um, that involved artists that are on a similar quest like Meyer Sound uh, for the ultimate sonic experience. And, and let's see what Bob Weir has to say about that. Over time, I've seen um, a lot of similarities between Grateful Dead and Meyer Sound's approach to it's it's almost like growth through experimentation so you try something and you make it better you try it make it better and in fact i remember i, I can't remember it would have been maybe like 80 87 or something or nine, somewhere around there where you were pushing um don and maybe even it was through harry to build a 15 inch floor monitor for because there at the time it was the 12 inch um ultra monitor you know, I remember Don looking at me, well, let's just make it. And I was like, well, why doesn't Meyer Sound make it? So we built that original prototype, 15-inch uh, wedge, at Ultrasound in a wood shop. And then it was a kind of thing where we, we, we built it in the shop, put it out there, brought it to John, and then John built it better, and then it became a product. And I think it was crucial with you guys as the test case, because if I was an engineer in a laboratory, I'd have no end place to test it or no beginning place to come up with the concept. So whereas you guys were feeding the data to the, the people that could – kind of translate your ideas into something and then us, people like us, I presume, presume we're bringing it to engineers to build it. So it's, it's a really unique dynamic that some people know and have seen and, and uh, it's been great to be sort of part of. So, well, um, the deal there, the deal there was that we were also all, all great friends. We, uh, we hung yeah. together on the road particularly, but, uh, but we'd get together at home and stuff like that. So we knew each other well and we could, yeah. uh, we could, we could talk, I, I could tell Don or, or Howard, uh, you know, how I felt about something. And, and uh, you know, like, for instance, that 15-inch monitor, uh, you know, what, was, what I was not getting from the 12-inch uh, floor wedge, um, 
that uh, I wanted to get from a, and why it was a, I thought it was necessary to make a 15, 15 inch wedge and, uh, and they got it. And they got it, which this, this is a beautiful prime example of, of Meyer sound showing that it's listening to uh, its users, always willing to adopt suggestions uh, that lead to improved and, and better products. And that resulted in, in Bob Weir getting the monitor that he wanted, which was the USM-1. Um, and that that product, we still have I don't know twenty of those that um, go in and out and still do shows, and, and uh, it still holds. The, as far as a non-powered product, it still holds the, uh, the the test and the torch. And a lot of other artists for years were using it, so it's it's a it's a very like we said a cool circle. And its 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 PA partner is called the MSL Two A, and that still does shows, uh, uh, Broadway touring shows. Uh, still still love to use that speaker. It's amazing. Yeah. But there was another collaboration like this uh, where that came up. The MJF 210 came apart, came about because of Metallica's pushing for a, you know, the artist pushing for a stage monitor. It was this same loop again, uh, yeah. and there you go. So it's a it's fun to be able to work and meet the needs of the artists. Right. Well. Let's make a little jump to one of the steepest venues that I am aware of, um, none other than Red Rocks in uh, Morrison. Um, look at those towers, the scaffolding. I mean, did OSHA approve of that at the time? Uh, OSHA wasn't invented, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, I mean, anyone, probably so many people on, on this thread have been to this building. There's a roof now, obviously, and it probably, it's probably where the, um, I don't know, the fourth array of MSL-3. So technically more than half that PA is above the current roof that's on that building right now. That's just mm -hmm. a crazy idea. And this one was one where you would just basically, you know, there's a motor behind the speakers. You motor would come up, the speaker, you slide it in, you put it in, you spin, you go to the next scaffolding area, you motor behind, slide it in. Just, you know, the fact that, I can't imagine how long it took to, I was about like to say, house. you make it sound very easy, you know, like there was a motor no, and you pick it up and everything was like, wow. Well, and you know, I look at something like that and I just, my, my practical mind says, well, how'd that get up there? But, yes. um, you know, this is again, that idea of just pushing to, you know, make it better. I'm not sure that tweeters were effective on the top row of speakers. I'm not, I'm not sure though. Mm. Gives, it, it gives defying gravity a whole new meaning. Yeah. Yes. And here, I mean, that's a, you know, that venue is subject to some pretty severe weather too which is you know kind of an interesting idea i've been through plenty of storms in that building and, and everything has to be brought up you can't take a proper truck so everything has to be brought up in a bobtail truck you have to offload your yeah. truck and, and <laughs> up little loads at a time yeah. holy god yeah and, and this one you can see i mean the, i'm not sure what's happening with the roof there but the, even even the band is going to take a pretty big hit if it rains that day and the, what you really see is how the difficulty of, in those days, of getting an up tilt on the system. How are you going to get yeah. an up tilt? Uh, you know, the yeah. modern world of, of rigging has now got so much flexibility. You can have a lower roof, and you can and you can rake your array up up the up the plane there, up the uh, incline. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and back in in MSO three days, it was just it was all you could do is down tilt. Up tilt was a pretty tricky thing to do for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, Greek theater in, in Berkeley, uh, again, uh, shed loads of MSL3. And yep. again, self-built scaffold. You're going to see a later picture of the Greek, and you'll see that the Greek now has a roof over it. And in those days, if you wanted to do anything besides just stack it on the ground, you literally had to bring in your own scaffold. And it was a testament to the quality level that the Grateful Dead um, aspire to at the time that they would come in and take the extra hours and hours and labor call to build a three high scaffold like you see there to get that PAF because otherwise you won't get it up the bowl at all if you just go stack yeah, it on no, the that, That's really true and in, in uh, the Greek um, all that cost was the artist cost for the most part so if you would say I want a roof I want scaffolding you know you you if you're representing a band you're coming in saying you're spending the band's money that didn't fly yeah. for a lot of folks. This, now, this is a good one. 
It's, it's my understanding that this is a, another milestone in my sound history because uh, something truly unique happened during this show. Well, well, well this was um, uh, Greek theater, 1984, it was, it, was, it was July. And this was where Sim found a receptive party to join a partnership to, to, to further the, the technology. We had done Sim for a couple of artists but, but all of them were like, oh, that's interesting, but go try your experiments on somebody else. We came to the dead and said, we're, you know, we have this emerging technology, we're working to figure it out, and they said, bring it. And we're literally, we are literally tapped into the system with uh, gator clips on the back of, uh, of a mono out of the console. That's how we're reading the PA. I do not suggest doing that uh, um, in the future. But um, so we were able to measure the concert with the with this FFT analyzer and uh, and be able to tune the system with the band on stage. And this was really a, a tremendous milestone in the development of the dual channel FFT, uh, the SIM and all that that's come since then. Yeah, be sure to watch uh, a webinar that we dedicated to the evolution of SIM. Uh, you will find that in our YouTube channel. Not only was this um, one of the first instances where um, primordial SIM, as we like to say, um, was introduced into large-scale sound reinforcement, but it also pioneered uh, another, uh, another game changer, which was, uh, which was the primordial CP10. Yes, and what you see there is uh, the... the hand-built CP4s uh, at the time, and four bands of parametric EQ. Um, and what you have is uh, these white parametric, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, white graphic EQs. They were the cut-only uh, graphic EQs. That's what they favored at the time. It was basically a passive device, and they felt like that gave them the, the best, uh, best uh, chance with the least amount of damage. Well, when we showed them what these parametric could do, with the SIM analyzer, that was the end of the road for the for that graphic EQ. So much so that unexpectedly, after this show, when we packed up our stuff to go, we we took the SIM analyzer, but they wouldn't allow us to take the prototype CP10s. Um, and uh, off they 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 finished the tour, and uh, so we didn't have those in order to develop the final CP10. It set us back a bit, but that's that's part of what you do here. Yeah, I'd like to make one comment. We, if we hadn't have shown them how the white was working with the SIM analyzer, we probably would have taken this home. But what we showed is after three of the filters, those twin T-notch passive filters interacted with each other. And actually, after you put in about three, they weren't working at all anymore. You were getting just kind of random EQ. We we're saying, this is not doing what it says. Even white didn't know this because they came out later to the factory all upset. I go, hey, listen, you know, you don't buffer the stages. I mean, you know, it, it really, they said, well, we only thought you'd use one at a time. I go, well, yeah, but that's not how people are using it. It's kind of like uh, the idea was is that this parametric we were building uh, would be, uh, you know, you could, it would do what the knobs are saying it's going to do, uh, which we showed them with SIM. It's one of the reasons why they kept it uh, because it, it was, I, I don't, I think they're, they had no idea how much they were struggling with these. And everything was like that. It wasn't just white. Everybody was making twin T notches. Altec, Lansing, uh, everybody was making twin T notches all coupled together. Four band pair of sounds. Yeah, it was, that's what everyone was doing. And this was a huge break from uh, uh, the uh, kind of industry standard at the time. Right. Made us a lot of friends, didn't it, Bob? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> right. So, so, um, not only do we see the pursuit of excellence in the audio team, but um, we also see that synergy once more of the pursuit of excellence on stage. So the next couple of slides uh, will show uh, Phil Lash's bass rig uh, evolution throughout the decades. Um, but this is, also, this is also a reason to stand still because this is also tangentially related to the 650 uh, subwoofer, which was um, used for Coppola, correctly? Yeah, this, this subwoofer, Coppola wanted to feel in the apocalypse now, he wanted to feel like he said, I think he, as he so said, he said, I want to feel it in the bathroom. I want to feel the bathroom shake. When I want, to, I want people to feel the napalm when it goes off. And most subwoofers at that time went down to about 80 cycles, sometimes a little bit less, but nothing went down to 
30 cycles. It just didn't exist. I mean, it, people would say it'd go down to 10 hertz and stuff. Like I said, the industry was really big on marketing uh, and uh, nothing. And so we did a shootout in, in uh, uh, with that, that 650. Actually, the one we did the shootout with was a single 15, but we went to a double made it more robust and more powerful. But uh, by the time the Phil heard it, but like no one had heard these low frequencies before going down to 30, 27 cycles. It was a brand new experience. Later, you will see when, when uh, uh, a stack of these, when Dan Healy uh, started using them in the PA, the first stack we did in Oakland, uh, he was working on the console and, and the sound came on and there was a huge com com aggressive low frequency sound he thought the stack had fallen over he jumped out of his seat looked up and it was the first time he had heard those low frequencies at, at a wall of sound like i mean that you know it was really uh i mean he really thought the stack had just fallen over and, and all over you know it, it was like really amazing uh, and uh i remember at the time i was trying to get them they were using banana connectors on the back and I said, I was saying to Don, you make sure, make sure that those, all those banana connectors are in phase. Said, Trust me, John, they're all in phase. We turned the power on, one of the subwoofers started flapping and going and blew the drivers out. Of course, it was reversed <laughs> phase. One of the reasons we got more careful with connectors and things is because when you're dealing with that kind of power, one driver like that out of phase in that group would, would take uh, try to absorb the power from the array. And we had no safety provision for that. I mean, it's, you can't, it's hard to correct for everything. Right. Uh, yeah. so, so, so here we see the um, CP10 uh, found its way into Phil's rig, which is uh, quite unprecedented. Yep, and this, I believe, I'm not sure if this is the one that the, so in the house system, we'd have six or seven or eight of these stacked up as, as left and right PA EQ. And it was always fascinating. We would, you know, in different ways, different times of deployment, but you take the PA, you put it in mono, you tune it, and then you would have to match all the A channels to the B channels with an FFT analyzer of some sort, just running signal through it. And you turn the knobs until they're exactly the same. Then you put this system back in the stereo and then you, you listen left and right and hopefully they're the same because it was hard to make the two sides match. Um, and then those ones with Phil, I think that could have been the time where, where you guys modified them to do like a minus 30 dB cuts on them, which was just incredibly crazy. You take the the tightest bandwidth and cut 30 dB, if you're like picking things. And it was, it was something he was there. And Haley was into that too, for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Also, well, also it, had us modify some of them to do, to be a whole CP10 with just all the filters below 100 yep. hertz. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, now, John, the other day you said something about these monitors. Uh, would you mind repeating that? I mean, the, the ACD studio monitors behind Phil's head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Those ACD monitors at the time cost you. Those are 833s. Those are 833s. 833. It's a different one, but it's, it's the it's a studio monitor that he decided to bring out for the rig, and uh, uh, yeah, these are yeah, you're right. These are 833s, uh, and uh, it just kind of startled me. But you know, it's like generally stuff they make for musicians is just terribly cheap stuff and buzzing and humming and just you know like, and to see them actually. Uh, you know, really not just first rig, but like rig after rig keep improving. And it's really exciting because I don't think we, uh, we have a tendency not to sell musicians the very best stuff as an industry, as a sound industry. It happens, you know, maybe because they, they can't afford very much, a lot, most of them and stuff like that. But it, it's, I, you know, I, I really feel that music is something that, that uh, is very special. And anyone that grows up in this industry knows that, Music should be preserved. It's the thing that that really lasts through all of the stuff that we're going through. Uh, music is what really lasts, and art, music, and things like that. We should do everything to make it wonderful with musicians, not like see what we can get away with. It, it's you know, I, I yeah. think audio out of this. If we come out of anything from what we're learning, we should really learn that time is precious, and we should we should not waste people's time by seeing if we can trick them into buying something because uh, they're not sophisticated enough to know. So, so this one is, you know, it's still a mystery to me what's holding the front of the drum riser up, but there's, there's two MSL threes under there and um, in the rack on his, the bottom spaces of that rack, there's some Crest amplifiers and the two M3 processors that are controlling that. And that was one of those periods of, you know, again, in a true guitar player fashion, that's, you know, just glancing his knees and going straight out to the people who um, are receiving that 
very clean, um, non-distorted guitar, and perhaps maybe <laughs> kind of heavily. So that was a yes. that was an interesting little period. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we see the the final or one of the last iterations of uh, Phil's bass rig. Um, yep. Impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now this is interesting because um, let me see if I can see this. In this one, you know, he. So you can see a CV10 up in the bass rig, which is actually one of the modified ones. It's got all filters that are from 500 hertz down, and there's a, there's a couple high frequency ones. On his laptop, he's got uh, compass open and. Um, this building, this was interesting because that X800 the bottom subwoofer was one of the first times that as him and I were going back and forth building this, you know, I'd, I'd play the bass a little bit and then he'd play it. And then when he'd play his lo lowest note on that instrument, which I think may have been 28 hertz, um, somewhere in that, that region, he had never heard that note before. So here he'd been playing a bass rig with this instrument for a couple of years. And all of a sudden through this approach, we're kind of building a system um, to where he can hear every note in the instrument and his eyes kind of light up and say, whoa, this is, that's there, you know, and, and you're playing the note if you're hearing some, some, you know, undertones of it, it's there somewhere, but when you hear it in its true capacity, it's fascinating. This rig, uh, John was instrumental in making that, I think that second 500 HP is extended frequency up to 500 Hertz. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a really, really cool balanced rig that was, I think, closest to the last one we put together i think derek have I you think... ever have you ever told phil about the vlfc um i haven't mickey knows about that for sure but um you know it's it would be worth a try <laughs> see, <laughs> see where see where that goes he's not stopping anytime soon i don't think so uh -huh. mm. and i think it's no it's notable and this goes back to the <clears throat> the 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 rig with the 833 stage monitors you know this is he wants to hear a full range signal. It's not. It's not enough just to hear a, a 15 inch driver like your standard kind of music uh, music store bass rig. He wants a full like it's going to go to the PA as if it was you know. He's got to hear it full range like it's going to come out of the PA. So you get all the transient response of the of the bass. Yeah. So yeah, and this would be another example of a of a, a collaborative approach where. You know, in working with with people like Phil or Bob or Billy or Mickey or any of these guys and tons of other artists, like if they're willing to like let you experiment and then they experiment, it makes you want to learn more about what they do. You know, I grew up with an interest in technology and music, but not performance. So in working closely, you know, you like well, if you, if this bass player or guitar player is going to understand frequency and talk to me in a language I know, I'm going to learn about notes so I can talk to them in a language they know. It's it that's a that's these guys are really good with that. It's very impressive, I think. Let's, I think, let's, uh, sorry, I go for John. I think I learned from Phil was that fact that, see, one of the things is science kind of traps us at the same time it teaches us stuff. I mean, we, we think about frequencies and notes and the low note is 40 cycle, 42 cycles, which means that it re, it's like a wave, it repeats uh, so many times per second and all this kind of stuff. But what we forget or what we, it's hard to remember is that it, it, there's an impulse. If, if you lie a firecracker off outside, it's, it's, it's a bang. But a firecracker contains all frequencies. It's just we don't think about it like that. When you bring a firecracker into a room, big uh, stadium or an explosion, you hear the bang and you hear a, a, a low frequency stuff and it changes, the sound is different. It's the same firecracker, but a different sound. So the, the transient relationship in notes are very complex and in, in you know when you think about it all the time and as phil wants to hear more pure sound he's talking about something that is kind of beyond a simple way of thinking about it and so you kind of have to you know, it, we're trying to talk to someone that has an idea in their head what they're looking for and we're trying to figure out it through technology if we're achieving it or not so the low frequency might give him um more uh, uh, structure in the transient response, like a firecracker in a room or an explosion in a room. However, that does present problems. It's gonna leak all over the stage. It's gonna leak into the house. It's gonna get in every microphone that exists. I mean, with low frequencies are hundred feet long, you know, thing. So we have, we battle between the desire to try and get them what they want, but at the same time, not wreck it for everybody else. So it's, it's complicated. And it's what experimentation is all about, is, is trying to see how to, can, and then we can make the subwoofers directional and cardioid and stuff like that. So you, there's, 
it's just, it's just, it's just, there's, it's not a, it's not like we're resistant to it. It's just complicated. Let's, let's, yeah, let's see did, what. He picked the hardest, he picked the hardest instrument to, uh, to reproduce for sure. <laughs> right. Let, let's see what, um, let's see what Weir has to say about this, because it uh, turns out that Phil was one of the major drivers within Grateful Dead in the pursuit of, uh, of an, uh, of a, uh, the sonic experience. We're all members of the Grateful Dead equally driven um, to push the advancement of sound. And I ask this because often a singer is the one who wants a better PA because they lean on it more than some other players. But did you guys all share that same drive or were you, know, one of you leading the other or was it pretty evenly? No, nah, I think the three of us who were most, actually three of us and then four of us, uh, Jerry, Mickey, or no, Jerry, Phil, and myself were, were uh, mostly, most particularly Jerry and Phil were, uh, were interested in, uh, in advancing uh, uh, our offerings and in, uh, in, in terms of uh, audio audio gear uh, I was yeah. I was a sort of a tag along on that and then uh, and then when Mickey joined the band uh, he uh, he also thought it was a, a pretty good idea Pigpen and uh, Pigpen wasn't and, and Billy I don't think were uh, all that uh, I don't think they cared that much one way or the other. <laughs> Yeah, driven by it. Because I do think it's interesting because you look at some of the, the history of this where, you know, Phil and his bass rigs, all these Meyer mini sound systems are his bass rigs. And and Mickey, you know, filled up studios with, with Meyer equipment. And, and then, you know, you at TRI, which is a beautiful Meyer install. Um, it, it's kind of cool to see this this way you guys drove into this this area for just sonic growth. Sonic growth, um, wonderful term. Talking about growth, look at the rise of the MSL. I mean, wow. Quantities really go stellar. Yeah, that, that, that was a puzzle for sure. A difference, you know, because when, when, you know, Don and Howard and Mike Brady um, and were really instrumental in sort of figuring out how to do this because, you know, we're talking about a time where all the rigging grids we personally had made from a, a metal fa fabricator all the chains that are coming from the grids to the speakers we built because they didn't exist. And then from speaker to speaker or carabiners from, you know, REI or other places. And then, you know, it was just a matter of figuring out how to do it. And, and in this case, these columns of subs are, are custom made straps that basically you build a block of three, you strap together, build another block of three, lift it up and you strap the straps together. And if, you know, if anybody in the disassembly process perhaps undoes the wrong strap, that whole thing is, a, you know, a pile of subs on the floor, but it was very um, uh, experimental period, but it was just okay. Nothing was fabricated. And that's one I give ultrasound some credit for um, coming up with ideas of how to make stuff road, not road worthy, but, but road usable. And, and from all these rigging grids to different things, because at that time, manufacturers weren't, weren't into making the whole complete system. That's something that John and Meyer sound were doing. We're basically they got in to realize that, wait, just make this thing complete so that people don't do it wrong and they can't take it too far out of where it's supposed to be. And I think this failure on a lot of uh, speaker manufacturers is they build a good speaker, but they don't, they don't necessarily, you can try this amp or this amp or that processor. So there's no consistency. So you walk into this PA and I won't get into names <clears throat> and you turn it on, it sounds nothing like the PA you had yesterday with the same boxes because everything downstream of the speaker cabinet is different. <clears throat> Right. This is um, this is a good shot in uh, Las Vegas that, you know, again, this was, I'm not sure, uh, this is a series of forklifts with MSL-10s used for delay towers, and this was a, um, someone could probably tell me how many MSL-3s, but there's a lot of them in here. Um, well, we uh, counted 40, yeah, we, we counted 48 house left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and but, this is a different um, show, which I... <laughs> yeah, a different uh, show, but the, the yeah. reason, the, the reason that, um, that we added these slides is because this is where we see a transition. This is where we see a new player, which is the MSL 10 a um, first yeah. as delay. And then um, not much later also as, as, as main PA. Um, can you tell a little bit about this transitional phase from MSL three into the, into the 10 a. Well, I, I think from ultrasound's perspective, I, we started with the MSL tens and I, I think we had them, as delay towers first, and again, this is, we, we had talked about trying to make Howard get on this call because he could probably give you the better answer, but um, I'll pick his brain later in private. Um, the MSL 10s were, we didn't have enough of them um, in order to use it for a main PA. And there was sort of, it, it was unknown at that point. And I do believe John, before those MSL 10s were made, 
Um, Mike Brady used to wrangle the jam tens from McCune for the summer stadium tours for Grateful Dead. So at, there was one point where uh, summer tour was coming up and the jam tens weren't available for a sub rental. And that was the full force drive to get the MSL tens into that spot. So. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is this is the next generation. Um, John, can you maybe tell us what 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 sets the the ten A apart from the three, or how it evolved, or what the the, the, the major milestones that led to the ten? What was one, the one of the things that uh, when the the arrays the MSL three arrays as, as we put more and more together, the power wasn't going up the way it should go up. And there was something that uh, uh, we weren't getting the, the increase. And when you double the number, you should get 60 even more. But we weren't getting that after a certain point. So I want to go back and look at look at the, um, you know, when you put these uh, dry speakers next to each other, you get interactions. So you get, it's kind of like throwing a bunch of pebbles on the water. You don't get a, a big coherent wave. You get lots of waves. And that doesn't really matter if you're only 100 feet. But as you get further and further away, uh, you don't get the link, the, 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 the link that you want. You don't get the distance that you want. So the MSL 10 became a project to see if we could get the whole, everything more coherent to do further throws. And, and uh, uh, you can see the array of horns. I mean, you, you know, mostly molosecular horns were done. I have a whole collection of horns up in Richmond, uh, up north here, uh, just a whole bunch of horns that were built from 1920 all the way through up. But they was always, they were always like exponential horn couplings. And, and so you get lots of interference with those. And so I wanted to experiment with uh, seeing if we could build 30 degree sections of something that would be more coherent to get further distance. And the MSL-10, first version at, at McCune's, and then, and then later we started to work on our own. Uh, at, you know, Meyer Sound was formed to create a product that would be, and it's probably why they wanted to use them for delay towers right away, just because we didn't market all these ideas. These were just, you know, you're thinking about it, you know, and then you get them out there. But people discovered they worked well for <laughs> shooting those balcony shots. That's why they, otherwise they wouldn't do it. You'd, you, you'd see us, you wouldn't have more than one picture uh, because then it didn't work. So one of the things that in this industry, if it works, you get every year you see it used in different ways because it actually does what it's supposed to. Uh, I don't know yeah. when they made the decision to go to use it as the main PA, but I think that's kind of why it started as the lay towers because it did. I mean, we first, we put a system, well, the one at McCune's, we put in the Oakland Coliseum because I wanted to show that we could do a point source sound at Oakland Coliseum Stadium with, um, you know, 60, 80,000 people and not have a bunch of speakers everywhere. So, you, you know, so uh, we needed something that would make it to the, all the way to the balcony, because, I mean, it, it, in, and the way the Oakland Raiders said it was, is they, and they announced when they, because we rented it, they, we took it there for the show and we hung it with a crane where we were gonna put it at the Oakland Coliseum and, the, and they announced over the sound system that they're gonna raise the ticket price a dollar to buy the sound system. And if you, <laughs> if you stand up and applaud, we'll buy it. If you don't, we want it all, the whole audience stood up and applauded. And I go, I, they never told me they were doing that. I don't remember wow. that, in the, it, it, oh. that thing, but like, that's kind of like, uh, was, and then uh, Ultra started getting an interest. I don't know exactly how Ultra, because they had a good relationship with McCune, so they may have heard it through that path. I'm not sure exactly how that evolved. So this brings us a, a little bit more into present. Uh, I take it we see some um, testing here. Um, Again, major stakeholders: Dan Healy, Don Pearson, uh, John Meyer, of course. Um, yeah, I don't. We, I'm not sure what. The, I mean, these are obviously MSL threes in there. I'm not sure what. There's something else they're being compared to here, but um, right. I'm not sure what that is in the shot. Yeah, this was a research tower they did uh, to try. I think it was to try out the tens. Is I'm, I'm not sure. I can't remember. It could have been. Yeah. 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 Um, and because this tends, if you, you know, in those pictures of, you know, this relationship, again, just to jump back, but you don't have to on the slide, is that, you know, we were building those MSL tens at Ultrasound's wood shop, which is what that shot was before, which was, uh, you know, and Joe, Joe Winslow, one of the fellows in the middle of that shot, is, um, was knee deep in hard trucker speaker cabinets. So it's, well, you know, ev continual evolution. Well, one, one of the things that was important in this, this, because we were doing the, we had built a tower out in uh, Marin County near the, uh, Travis Air Base or wherever it was, 
but they started to complain, even though we were a mile away about the sound, the, the generals and colonels that lived on the hill or surrounding the air base bitch that we were driving them crazy. So we had to tear the tower down. So I think that's when Ultra decided to put one up that, you know, Dan says, we, we could do it too, because we were doing research on the tan. And I think, as I remember, they were gonna decide to help out. They were very good like that, helping out, uh, you know, in that sense of, you know, like, yeah. Right, so in we're- In that we're, case, you're going from Air Force Base to wine country. I'm not sure what the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an interesting dynamic because I think the wine country might be a little more particular about noise. But so, so we're 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 um, slowly creeping into the present. I think Bob, when we discussed this, this is one of those instances where we see that USM won, right, with the fifteen inch yes. for for Bob Weir. Because if you're a gyoto monk, you need it. You need to dish it out. A twelve inch monitor just won't do it. <laughs> those guys, they just yeah, bring it. two of them. <laughs> And then it's, it's no longer the Grateful Dead. Um, now we see uh, a new formation. Uh, Jerry Garcia has passed. Um, Derek, um, what do we see here? I mean, this is a Milo system up at the gorge. And, um, you know, a, a, uh, that run of dates was, um, was all Milo. And uh, I, I can't remember what year Milo came out, but um, typical gorge thing, wide open uh, space in Washington, which so many of us have gone to. And, uh this was um I, this tour was about i think five or six weeks i can't remember the length of this tour but it was the first time they had gotten back together as the, with the um the, the primary members um and then there was a second one uh, with the same lineup but actually there was two lineup changed a little bit in between them right and then and then to us in 2004 major milestone um, the, um, the inauguration of the, uh, of the Pearson theater. Um, John, what led you to build this unique, uh, room? Well, we would demonstrate speakers outside for clients and they'd say, what does it sound inside? So we'd go into a warehouse courses, which was awful, you know, we'd have to go. And so they say, well, we have to try it in our facility. So we decided that, you know, maybe if we build a facility, we could kill two of these steps. And so we wanted to build something that we could use for research. This room is completely floating on ISO rubber materials they use for earthquake suppression. And um, it's all uh, has a, you know, so we wanted to have a place that we could look like a theater uh, with a balcony and, and try sound systems out for people and have a place that we could play movies. I'm always, I've been in the movie industry since I was a kid, you know, radio and, and my uncle worked for Walt Disney, so sound. So I mean, I grew up in this industry. And so I like playing movies and working with the movie industry. They like sound, good sound too. Uh, the, uh, so it led us to build this room and, and uh, we wanted it to look nice. So we hired an architect so it wouldn't look like, a, uh, you know, done with, a, you know, boxes, egg crate boxes or something to have it look nice. But in between those slats, there's lots of absorption material. And we wanted to experiment with, we wanted to keep the room rectangular and simple. I don't like, you know, slope, you know, one of the things that there's a lot of notions and people will make very complex shapes to their rooms with 10 degree tilts and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if the room is live, that matters, but if the room is dead, that none, doesn't make much different, you know? So I wanted to kind of show you could, you could get a good sounding room without it being too expensive architecturally. Right. And, and named after Don Pearson, which, which uh, shows how dear Don Pearson is to the community at large. Don was working with us at the time. You know, he was helping and, and helping with power. And well, one of the things that we wanted to be able to do is, is, is have quiet power, isolated power. I mean, they learned, you know, Greenville Dead learned an awful lot in ultrasound on the road, working with power and, and hum and, you know, just getting all this stuff to work. It's a lot of, we call it, industry calls it tribal knowledge which isn't very, a nice term but it's it's because it, it it because it doesn't come through kind of the formal way of universities and things like that but that what they really learn is practicality like what what how to what and working with electricians and and how to put stuff together so it was very instrumental in building that room in terms of isolation powered power tr transformers working with the electrical people electricians and engineers, uh, you know, uh, so uh, 
so that's why you know we felt like um, we want to kind of like respect it's like like uh, respect the knowledge that he had gained through this experience we should we should have degrees for people uh, that learn it through this path rather than just through the universities we only really uh, we don't really uh, you, you just have to know that people know things, you know, and yeah. you don't have a very good way of representing knowledge that's learned uh, by this method, like, like what the knowledge of, of doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows, working with electricians and things like that. Derek, Derek, yeah. can you relate to yeah. that, to what John is saying? Yeah, so it, it's funny because the, uh, as I was digging through different pictures, um, there's a whole series of pictures that, you know, only somebody like Don would take of, power panels and grounding schemes from shows, from events. So like if they were in some stadium and the power was really bad or, or, or where venue, whatever, they, you'd see clamps of ground wires going here, there, and every, and that's that field learning, field knowledge. And, and he would document it with, with pictures for next time they're back there. And here we look on our iPhones and say, oh, last time we were here, we did this. But, you know, these are buckets of film that have been developed. And there's, uh, let me open this one up and get that, that picture and do the same thing again. So it was, um, his, his knowledge of that was, was, was incredible. And, and again, with, with Don, it was, his mission was actually to divulge that knowledge to the people around him. It wasn't about holding it and his, his idea. In fact, yeah, I think he had more fun, you know, pushing his knowledge on, on people in that experience because it was just enjoyable. And he wasn't, there's a lot of folks on this, this planet that learn something and cap, capture it and don't let it out. Right. But he, he was one of those people who was, you know, he right. passed it out. Real fast. Yeah. And he applied, you know, I mean, like we, we joke about it, that he applied that same mentality to everything from the, from a coffee maker to uh, the proper way to drink wine to, what, to just everything. It was, it was, Pay, it was wonderful. Paying it forward. Yeah. Well, Don was, a, Don was an evangelist for sure. Yeah. Yes. So, so here we see another testimony to an evangelist. Um, this is a, this is a room named after bear. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about bears lab? One one of the things that Bear kept saying uh, that he, he didn't think we should be aiming speakers at people, and he felt like they should be flat. Uh, and one of the things that this horn, if you look at that horn up there, this is this horn was done by uh, a computer. Uh, we have uh, we we rent this or lease this computer technology. Uh, it's called boundary element or finite element. I'm not sure. It's not my world. Uh, this high level math world, but it allows us to design a horn that it has very smooth coverage. And in cinema, it's very important because the vocal may come from the center and has to cover every seat perfectly. And, it's, and, and not just the every seat, but the seats downstage in front, house left, house right. That's where important people go when they come into a cinema late. They go down and sit right at the edge of the, where that corner of the speaker has to hit. So this horn, we spent a lot of effort on this horn to make it very, very smooth so that it would have a very even coverage, like a really good floodlight. And it's interesting because it doesn't seem to matter how you aim the horn. And so he just can put them flat in the room. So I think Bear had really good intuition. It's just that he couldn't explain it technically. And, you know, he'd be frustrated because he would think he'd have these ideas, but we have to figure out, we have to make the ideas. You have to make it so that it's practical. In other words, you can't just tell people don't, tilt the horn in you have to prove to them to the mixers and things like that it doesn't matter you know that you can you know we've done a lot of experiment we don't do it anymore but you do a lot of experiment with it you're bending them around aiming them not aiming it in and all that kind of stuff to kind of convince them in, in this case it doesn't matter uh and so you know i'm trying to respect how we talk to people who have really good intuition but how do we translate that to the technical world and then show people that that intuition is is something worth that we should think about, you know, and and uh, because it makes them, the whole thing with Bear Lab was we're learning one of the big mysteries. Talk about people that keep things to themselves is how sound is mixed to make sound spatial in the room. This is kind of an art. This does not have a very solid science base on how you'd make different positions like close to you, far away on stereo systems or three channel systems or multi channel systems. How mixers create and placing things in the room. I, I don't know if we'll ever figure it out technically. We may always have to hire mixers to do it. And they're very guarded about how they make those voices work and how they position things in the room. They don't like to share that because that's their skill. Uh, I don't know if we'll have another way of figuring it out. We haven't found any mechanism to do it yet. But 
uh, that's the whole next movement is what we call, you know, kind of spatial sound. And, and that whole, the bear, bear's lab, bear would have been very happy in that room because uh, a lot of things that we talked about in the early days, we've manifested into practical things, you know, like you can have, uh, you, you don't have to, you don't mix stereo, you can have all the bass coming out of say one speaker on the right, left side or the violin on the right side and everyone in the room can hear it. So you, you, the stereo ideas for a one seat idea sitting in one seat, you could have everything work for you. But in our world, it's gotta work for a lot of seats. I mean, even in Bear's Lab, you may have 10 seats, 10 people in the room that it's gotta work for everybody. PA has to work for everybody. It can't just be the front of house. And there are systems out there that and the people build only to get the front of house to work and could care less what else happens. Right. And, That's a dangerous place. So, uh, you know, dangerous place for engineers to go because you're trying to like, you know, in, in a lot of the systems we deploy um, in, in arenas, <clears throat> we're, we're compromising. You don't do a lot of hard panning because you don't want the guy over here not to hear something. But we do that, which probably tons of people do, where if you have tons of arrays, you have, you know, it's a left, a right, a left, a right. And you keep going around. So everybody has a little bit of stereo and then you light on the stereo and the mixing part. So at least there is some imagery because a band like, um, you know, Dead and Company with 120, whatever inputs going into the PA, you've got to find places to put them all because you can't run down the middle of everything because it'll just be a big sonic mess. Um, this is a picture. This is further Greek theater. So there's sort of, a, um, we in fact, for this show had that um, backdrop made from the same guy who made the one from the Grateful Dead shows. Um, and at this point, you can see the Greek theater with a roof on it. You're flying a PA. So there is progress in the world of audio here. And no again, more scaffolding, Bob. Room. No scaffolding. <laughs> but uh, and just the uh, mica side shots and, and Milo mains. Right. <clears throat> and then this thing. Hmm. hmm. Bob, you yeah. were there, right? <laughs> um, I'm seeing further. I don't. Uh, oh, this. Oh, yeah, this was a wonderful show. This thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks yeah, like okay. a unique um, challenge with, with, with the asymmetric yeah. seating, with the different level, the different tiers of seating on, on either side. Yeah, this, so this, I mean, this Levi Stadium was open only a, not too long before this. Um, they gave us carte blanche to do whatever we wanted. Um, in fact, normally when we do a stadium show, you, the, the groundskeeper is your either your best and your your best friend or your worst enemy. So you meet the groundskeeper first, and you find out what you can do on this field. And this literally, I met the groundskeeper on day one. He's like, "Oh, we're replacing the grass next week, so don't worry about it." So we could do anything we want with towers, any weights, any distribution. On this one, we do, you know, delay towers. We did quad sound going backwards on the delay towers, and I think there was three hundred and something boxes in there, three sixty in that building, which was that was a fun project. And there's so, also people sitting um, behind the stage, right? Yeah, yeah. So we and we built these little clusters of speakers and video walls all the way around. So no matter where you sat, you'd see and you'd certainly hear. <clears throat> so. And That's they even fun. cued a rainbow. The lighting department made a rainbow happen in the middle of the stage. Really? That's right. Uh, yeah. quite... <laughs> well, this looks this looks more intimate. Um, yet another formation we already saw during the introduction that Bob Ware played in many formations um, after Grateful Dead. Phil with his yeah. bass rig again, uh, the one that we saw before. Yep, this is just on Mount Tam. It's you know uh, Bob showed up to play, and uh, it was that was a good good little play. Right. Dead and Company still playing. Yes, yeah, so and this one you can see sort of, you know, it's a 360 degree setup. So you've got, um, you know, left, right, left, right. You work your way around the back. There's some, um, you know, cardioid subs flown up there. There's subs on the ground. It's, it's an open look. It was kind of that idea to kind of keep the stage space open and clean. Yes, there's video. Yeah, video. <laughs> so what do we see here, yeah, Derek? This is a show that's been going down in Mexico for the past four or five years. Um, so it's Dead and Company, and it's, it's built up on a beach. It's a, it's a fun event. Uh, it's obviously not happening this year, but uh, hopefully it'll get back on the books for next year. Or not actually 2022, not 2021. Um, and it's a, it's a Leo rig that we've, we had sent down that way. Right. It's interesting seeing the buildings, too. Here's Shoreline. You come back to the same building. There's a ton of yeah. pictures from the 80s in here, and it's just... There are so many similarities in these buildings. It's it's uh it's fascinating. This is a Leo and uh, 
Leo line PA, I think I can't see. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating the different approach in the same space. Right. Yeah. From from the from the yeah. flown columns of, of six fifties to the uh, to the cardioid deployment and like you really can see the yeah. evolution. Yeah. Right. So um there's your office. Well not yeah. now maybe, but there's your there there's your typical office. Yeah. Yeah, that, that office is temporarily closed. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Well, so this uh, this is just a fun shot of you know the madness in front of house, and and um, you can see, which is funny, if you look to the right, you see those effects racks. There's a dark effects rack in there that was built in I think 1982. So some of that stuff is still going strong. Wow, 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 wow. So you mentioned these, um, Bob, I think it was you that mentioned the monks when we talked about the um, USM-1 monitor uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Drum Planet, because you said you need that one, right? There, we've, we've had a long relationship with the Gyoto monks and Mickey Hart uh, is, you know, is, is an amazing ambassador to, um, uh, a sonic ambassador to the world. And so this is one of the, really interesting people there. They make the most amazing music if you ever get a chance to be in the in the space of it. It is really fascinating. Because I, I, I'd like to think that I did my homework. Isn't it true that these monks did a concert in around 95 um, with, um, with some Grateful Dead members? I, I wouldn't be able to verify that. Okay, okay. Well, I looked it up this morning. Um, wow. So, so we're looking essentially at a, uh, we're looking essentially at a, a long friendship, long lasting friendship, uh, well over decades, decades. Um, and here we see some of those key players. Um, we've also somewhat come to the end of uh, today's webinar. Does any of the panelists want to make any closing remarks? It's been a super interesting journey, um, starting with the wall of sound into the present. Um, have we I, I mean, also, one thing I, one thing I was going to mention earlier, which I forgot to, was that I think one of the things um, John was mentioning earlier about how a guitar player is handed this piece of equipment to play through, and it's an in, in, inferior piece of gear, and then us engineers are building these or are assembling these hi-fi sound systems. What these guys set up was they wanted there's this cohesiveness to their sound because the gear starts sounding good. So the bass rig sounds good to start with, the guitar sounds good to start, and then we can put that into a PA and make it sound good louder. Because I've always said, if you sound like crap, you're gonna, and I'm at front of house, you're gonna sound like crap really loud. And if, if you, but if you sound good, you're gonna be translated to the crowd sounding good. And these guys got it. And, and you know, I don't know who decided to put, I know a Fender Twin is a Fender Twin and it's been put in front of a guitar player, but you know, guitar is a full frequency instrument and that, that cabinet's not. So it was interesting to see that. And that's one of the things I think that may have clarified and made the Grateful Dead stand out a little differently when it came to sound and people would say, these guys sound really good. Well, the source is good, so the result can be good. Right. <clears throat> John, can you relate to that? I mean, it's such a rich history. Um, I, I, don't, I, I see people that do not work with each other, just work with each other. I, I'd like to think that I see people that have befriended each other. like. I think one of the most interesting things, I saw a young woman uh, play a, she had like this little speaker thing and her music on it. She's a very classical musician. She's trying, she's showing it to a lot of to donors and she's playing different pieces of music through this radio that she has that she recorded herself or someone recorded for her. And you couldn't tell what it was. I mean, it just was totally garbled. She says, now you can hear the drum, and you hear, the, here we're doing this here, and all that kind of stuff. And I was sitting out in the audience, and I, I realized that, you know, musicians will listen into these things in a way that uh, other people won't hear it. And so one of the things that we wanted to do all along, we didn't know this, we know it better now, is that if you wanted to translate, I was saying to, the head of the school, you've got to teach these kids how to record so other people can hear it. You know, it's not, they hear it because they've been, they know what it is. It's like the brain figures it out, but we want it to be more universal than that. In other words, what hi-fi does is it makes a violin sound like a violin to everybody. Everyone recognizes it. If it's all garbled, 
the violin is, and he uses the same speaker all the time, he gets used to it, it'll sound like a violin to him, but nobody else. And so it's a universality good sound. That's why it's hard to sell. It's, it's easy to sell high quality television. You can see if everything's green or blue or fuzzy or out of focus, it's instant. But with sound, it's harder. It's more, it's more how you feel about it and how it sounds and you, you want it to be universal. So a lot of the thing with the Grateful Dead, I remember talking to them, I went to the meeting one day to say to them, they invited me to a, a board meeting Jerry did about explain why they want to get rid of the people recording. This was early on. I said, you know, I like them recording out there. It makes us, it puts us all on our toes. They're recording what we're doing. You know, we're talking about, we want to do this hi-fi experience. We're, we're, we're giving all these thoughts about what we're doing, but they're recording it. They'll, they'll have lots of time to figure out in the history, in the future, were we just telling the truth or not? Or were we just fooling ourselves? So I said, just, why don't you just cage them off and put them in front of the, they were bugging people and telling people to be quiet. I said, just make a fence, put them in a fenced area and in front of the consul or something. But I like it. If you're asking for my vote, my one vote, I would say keep them. Uh, I like being tested. It'll make us all work really hard to make sure this sounds good. And I think that's what this is all about. How do, how do we do it? talk about it and then make sure we've done it you know and i think that's the, the philosophy we've carried from the beginning people like bob mccarthy that beat his brains out learning how the early sim machines worked i mean these things were really really difficult to do in the beginning and we did it because we could make things sound better and awesome. that's what this in in the hard work that everyone's put into this i really really appreciate it. it's like a it was like a manifestation of a lot of work and everyone participates in it it isn't me or it isn't Bob, but it's it's not just Derek, but it's all the people that help and and make this work. I mean, it's a tribe of people. It's tribal knowledge in the sense that everyone knows needs to know what to do, and that's the hardest thing to convey, especially in the time where where everybody just wants to make money, quick money. Yeah, you right. know, it's hard to to, to get people to. Re I mean, it's harder work, and and if we make it sound good for everyone in the audience, it costs more money, more speakers. Are we going to gain paid more? Probably not. So it's easy to say, forget it. Let's just make it sound good at the house. I mean, it's it's what it's what makes why they should be appreciated when they go to the extra work to make it sound good for everybody. Anyway, that's my thought. No, yeah. it's I, yeah, and, and I, I mean, awesome. let me jump in here. So that's that's your legacy you're putting in place, which you know, legacy might not be a financially viable thing, but it is what you're doing, and it's what we're doing. And like I got. You know, at Ultrasound, Jeff Peters, who's our chief engineer, is, is one of these guys who all just have an idea and just say, help, because I know that's his skill set. And, and it's like, it's, it's not about any one of us and this team of, again, from those old days with, with Don Howard, Mike, uh, Jeff, and all these people who just like, it's a collective thing and we're not trying to make the quickest buck. We're trying to make something that we are all like what we do, so we want to make it better. And, and, uh, and yeah, it's not financially lucrative, but we're still doing it, so I guess it's kind of working. Well, yes. I, I, I say here, here, and, and kudos and hats off to all of you. Uh, I, for one, know for sure that I would not be occupying this profession if not for the likes of you. Um, I like always like to quote Isaac Newton, who once said, if I see far, it's because I stand on the shoulder of giants. And we each have our giants that we can think of. So um, uh, in the interest of tribal knowledge, I propose that we open up the communication lines and allow for some Q&A. If you would like the panelists uh, to ask any questions, please put your question in the comments of the Facebook stream. And then we'll take a couple of minutes to answer those questions. Um, while you're populating those questions, um, I'm going to take the time to gratefully uh, express my gratitude, genuinely express my gratitude to today's panelists, uh, starting with our guest appearance, uh, Derek Featherstone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for delivering all the wonderful collateral that we got to see here, we got to see here decades of, of history. Um, of course, also our CEO and, and, and President John Meyer, once again, thank you so much for making yourself available to conduct this webinar, which I think is 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 pivotal in the industry of live sound um, reinforcement and finally the venerable bob mccarthy my co-host always a great and uh, you know my mentor if i if i may uh, always a great pleasure thank you bob for for joining us um uh, today um so i'm going to look at the chat um and before we start rolling credits and 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 adjourn um it looks like um there are little little to no questions from what I can tell. 
Um, so, so I think, uh, sorry. I will, I'll make one little brief closing statement myself, very sure. brief. That is that, <clears throat> that the Grateful Dead were, were the original musical inspiration that made me want to step away and really think about music as a career. And it, then it was the Grateful Dead sound technology um, and the amazing experience of listening to the wall of sound that made me decide I wanted a career in professional audio. That's what drew me to it. I can look at those events, the very clear milestones in my life. And then, so for me to be able to then join um, and, and have my life end up, you know, the paths end up twining so that I found myself doing parts, uh, contributing to part of their journey is a really a special and amazing thing. And I'm very honored to have been part of that and worked with these great artists and to have worked with John, to work with Derek, to work with Don and all these great people and be part of that collaborative team striving to make memorable experiences in sound for the audiences of these shows. Right. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's interesting to see we're sitting in this un, unheard of period, and and uh, as I was joking joking with Bob, I think we're on the hundred and not joking, I guess, but one hundred and forty third or fourth day of isolation, so to speak. The fact that live sound and live music music has been removed from all these people's lives is is a very strange concept. I know, you know, I got into this business because as a kid, I love music, I love technology, and and it drove me to get, you know. To, to get there and I'm, I feel grateful that I actually can make a living on what I like to do. Um, but this would be interesting because I, it, it's got to, the, the effect of music on people has been challenged right now because it's been stripped away. And, and ideally once we're back on target here, I, I think a lot of great music is going to come out, I think. Uh, it, but this is a, a weird one to see in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime. I, it's, a, it's amazing just to see the, the plug pulled and it turned off. Right. Well, mm -hmm. Let's 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 hope for the best. Um, yep. So a recording of today's webinar, as always, will be available um, on our YouTube channel, Thinking Sound, within the next couple of hours. Or so, and unless anyone would like to um, answer, uh, add anything in in closing, I, I propose that we start rolling credits. Sounds good. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hats off. Uh, kudos. And let's roll credits. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>